Jesus for uh, for this opportunity to uh, come for this program. It's been really nice and uh, over the last few days. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about uh, today is it's a slightly different title, but uh, talk about uh, interacting atoms and artificial gauge fields. And there'll be two uh, parts to this talk. The first has to do more with fractional quantum hall uh, physics, uh, and the second I'll touch upon very briefly to this ladder uh, system that. Mark has just mentioned. Uh, so this is uh, work done. Uh, the the first half is mostly work done in collaboration with my student uh, Kiran Hickey, uh, together with a couple of uh, postdocs who were at Perimeter but who have now gone on to other positions. Um, uh, so so we've heard a lot about topological phases of quantum matter over the last few days, uh, and this is of course uh, you know work going back to quantum hall physics, both integer and fractional uh, quantum hall states. Uh, but it's been rejuvenated uh, a lot by the discovery of uh, topological insulators, two and three dimensional topological insulators. Uh, and there is clearly some very precise ways in which you know, one can define, at least for, these, uh, for, for integer uh, states or non-interacting systems, uh, there, is, there is this very precise integer quantization of a certain response function and you know, states at the boundary. Uh, and in some ways, the topological insulators are similar. There is a certain uh, coefficient uh, called the axion uh, term where uh, there is some quantization of this uh, value of this coefficient. Uh, and just like there are chiral edge states, there are chiral uh, Dirac surface states. Okay. Uh, so one of the things uh, that people have been uh, sort of uh, done more recently is to realize uh, the quantum anomalous Hall effect uh, in these systems. Uh, and roughly, we are thinking about, in momentum space, uh, this kind of torus uh, geometry of the Brillouin zone, where uh, at every point uh, in momentum, one defines uh, energy bands. And in the simplest case, uh, we just have two energy bands here. Uh, and, and one can define. Uh, the system is basically defined by having the energy dispersion of these bands as well as knowledge about their wave functions. Uh, so, so this uh, simple uh, two-band Hamiltonian looks like some particle, uh, like a fictitious uh, spin in a, in a magnetic field in momentum space. Uh, and as was uh, mentioned already in, in a number of talks, including uh, yeah, Ian Spillman, the non-trivial band topology, the information about that is contained uh, in the direction of this uh, magnetic field in momentum space. Uh, so, so that if there are certain uh, non-trivial textures in momentum space of this uh, magnetic field, then it leads to certain topological invariants. Okay. Uh, so in uh, recent uh, years, one, one uh, a place where this kind of physics has been realized is in topological insulator thin films, uh, where you know, one has a very small uh, gap due to the thinness of this film. Uh, and one can undergo band inversion uh, as a function of a certain magnetization introduced by dopant atoms. Uh, or in the language of surface states, one can think of these magnetized uh, atoms as gapping out uh, the surface Dirac fermions in this problem. Uh, and so people have measured, for instance, uh, going down to very low temperatures, uh, measured fairly good uh, quantization up to one part in 10 power 4, so not as good as the quantum Hall effect, but uh, nevertheless, fairly uh, good uh, precision. Uh, more recently, of course, there's this very beautiful work that we've heard about over the last few days, uh, sort of done here, uh, sort of referring to work from Tillman's group, where uh, one has uh, realized the, the Haldane model for uh, fermions, and uh, one can sort of measure you know, Berry curvatures, one can measure uh, where gaps close, uh, and sort of map out a phase diagram that looks very much like the theoretical uh, plot here, showing that there are both you know, churn bands uh, and whose sign can, the sign of the churn number can change, uh, as well as topologically trivial phases induced by imbalance between the two A and B sublattices. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, this is sort of the slides from uh, some pictures from the uh, paper by uh, uh, Monica and this is from uh, in Blo uh, from uh, Emmanuel Bloch's group, uh, where uh, one has realized the the sort of Hofstadter model uh, with a given flux, and so again one can measure churn numbers of these churn bands. So so what we uh, are interested in uh, and sort of be the theme of the talk is 
to think about the interplay between sort of band topology and strong correlation physics. Uh, so one of the things we've been sort of thinking about in my group is to think about these kinds of questions of uh, interplay in the context of solid state materials, uh, but I'll not talk about that uh, today. Uh, but uh, we're exploring similar questions also in the context of cold atomic gases, and that's what I'll focus on. Okay. So there's two parts to this talk. The first part, I'll talk about interaction effects in the Haldane uh, model, uh, and I'll argue that it leads to, and sort of shown uh, numerically, that it leads to certain types of non-coplanar magnetic orders in in case where spin degrees of freedom uh, play a role. Uh, and this non-coplanar magnetic order, if you think in the language of bosons, is some kind of super solid phase of bosons. Uh, and I'll show that you know, one can start from this and sort of melt this super solid phase, uh, and that gives rise to uh, a bosonic uh, Laughlin liquid, or in spin language, uh, it, it's a chiral spin liquid uh, of these, in this Mott insulator of these uh, fermions. Uh, and in the second part, I'll talk about the system that Marcus uh, mentioned, uh, which is talk about you know, what happens if you take a ladder with pi flux and think about interacting bosons. So this doesn't you know, directly have to do with quantum Hall physics, but nevertheless, it's an interesting system to explore. Okay. So let me begin by, uh, so, so this uh, idea that you, know, you can have interesting phases induced by interactions uh, in nearly flat churn bands, uh, was sort of explored by a number of people, and more most recently, it's kind of again been rejuvenated by a work where you know people have started thinking about making extremely flat bands in order to sort of mimic continuum Landau levels in some sense. And so, in the regime where you have partially filled uh, flat bands, uh, in this case with bosons, uh, one can think of this you know as being analogous to bosons at half filling in Landau levels. Uh, and so long as the interactions are kind of small compared to the bandwidth, uh, one can sort of work within the lowest Landau level, and uh, numerics uh, show that one can realize uh, the analogs of uh, the fractional quantum Hall effect of bosons in these lattice systems. Uh, the, the, what I'll uh, focus on uh, is asking what happens if you have fermions in these systems. Uh, which is, for example, the kind of uh, experiments that uh, is being done in Tilman Eslinger's group, where uh, we have a honeycomb. So in this case, in the experiments, it's a brick wall geometry, but here I'm going to assume it's like an ideal honeycomb system uh, for, for the talk. Uh, and here in this uh, honeycomb system, one has you know, fluxes uh, which uh, penetrate plaquettes, triangular plaquettes uh, here in the Haldane model. And I'll assume that we have two flavors uh, instead of the single, uh, you know, spinless fermions, assume we have spin up and spin down fermions, uh, which sort of uh, in this uh, band structure. Now imagine that I put my chemical potential there, or in terms of particle number, I fill up the lowest band with spin up fermions and also with spin down fermions. So we have twice uh, as many fermions. So the total uh, churn number is two e square over h, or there'll be. In, the, in this problem, you know, there'll be one chiral edge mode for spin up, one chiral edge mode for spin down. Okay. And uh, the question we would like to ask is what happens if you start from here and start cranking up uh, interactions in the system? Okay. Uh, so there is a very nice uh, proposal uh, due to sort of going back to sort of Kalmir, Laughlin, and uh, others, uh, uh, Shaogong Wen, uh, Wilczek Zee, who are thinking about spin liquid physics. Uh, and it turns out that you know one can map, as in fact uh, Jason was mentioning uh, yesterday, uh, this idea that you can take you know uh, two integer quantum Hall systems and somehow fuse them together to form the bosonic Laughlin liquid. Here, one can think about you know taking two integer quantum Hall systems that spin up and spin down, and basically Goodswill are projecting, and that's completely project out double occupancies, uh, and it gives rise to a very similar. Uh, state where you have a bosonic Laughlin state where these Zs now you can think of as uh, you know, labeling the location of the upspins in the system. So the upspins occupy half the lattice, downspins occupy half the lattice. Uh, but if you think of spin up as hardcore bosons, and one can sort of map it to a very similar wave function that uh, Jason was explaining to us yesterday. Okay. Uh, so what we would like to sort of ask then you know, is, is you know, this is a particular variational sort of guess for what might happen. And the question is, you know, in, if you take a given Hamiltonian, you know, are these phases realized, or is there something more that we can learn? 
so so this is uh, you know uh, so this uh, we started by thinking of just doing simple you know Hartree mean field theory. So just take this Hubbard model and just decouple the interactions in some mean field limit, uh, and this shows the phase diagram that we obtain uh, when we vary t two, which is the strength of the second neighbor hopping, uh, and the interaction strength u here. Uh, so of course, in in when interactions are small, uh, these bands are all well separated. So of course, nothing happens to them. Uh, so this just realizes the you know the uh, quantum hall uh, insulator here and it's kind of uh, badly labeled once we get up here these bands sort of overlap in energy uh, so that we get a metallic system here uh, but of course the gap between the bands at every momentum point is still preserved okay. so once interactions get strong enough uh, if t2 is negligible we know that this just reduces to the usual heisenberg model on the honeycomb lattice and one recovers sort of the nail order uh, or in this case, a spin density wave order with uh, the, this kind of commensurate spin density wave uh, in this picture. Uh, but if the second neighbor hopping is uh, large, and here larger than about one half of the nearest neighbor, uh, we find that there are other interesting non-coplanar states that uh, emerge. Okay. Uh, and in particular, there's a very wide window, and this sort of persists out to fairly large interactions, uh, where one finds uh, what we call a tetrahedral order where uh, spins kind of organize themselves uh, on the honeycomb lattice in a way that they point towards one of four possible uh, directions uh, pointing towards the four corners of a tetrahedron. Uh, so of course, this, this is not fixed in, in spin space. Of course, you can sort of rotate, globally rotate these uh, spins. Uh, but, but nevertheless, there's this relative orientation that's uh, sort of fixed, such that when you go around uh, one of these honeycombs, you sort of go A, B, C, A, B, C. Uh, going around, you know, one of this uh, little triangles of this tetrahedral, one of the faces of this tetrahedral. Uh, so this is a non-coplanar state. Uh, it's formed by superposing three different uh, momenta uh, here, and it has a very large uh, spin chirality. And it's, I mean, you can really think of this as a skirmion crystal. In some ways. Okay. Uh, so what's interesting is that this is a state uh, which uh, has been called a regular magnetic order. Uh, so what that means is that in, on certain lattices, uh, certain types of states have the property that if you look at any correlation function that's SU2 invariant, in other words, something like spin correlation, the spin triple products, uh, they are all completely uniform on the lattice. And the only reason this magnetic order sort of breaks lattice symmetries is because it's actually magnetically ordered. So if we imagine taking these orders and sort of rotating the spins globally and somehow averaging over this, uh, then in fact the state would be completely translationally invariant. Okay. Uh, so this means that, you know, imagine now that we can actually start with such a state and imagine that quantum fluctuations somehow cause these uh, tetrahedra to fluctuate, uh, then in principle one could quantum disorder this uh, magnetic state and hopefully recover some kind of a state which retains a large uh, spin chirality. Okay. So to show that this is not, uh, you know, just an artifact of, you know, doing a specific mean field theory, uh, we've also looked at what happens in the strongly uh, interacting limit where one can map it to a spin model, where in addition to Heisenberg terms, one gets terms which are proportional to the scalar spin chirality at third order in the hopping. Uh, again, coming from the fact that when fermions, you know, uh, do some kind of ring exchange processes, they're sensitive to the flux enclosed in these triangles. Uh, in the language of bosons, uh, such spin chirality terms basically refer to correlated hopping of bosons where, you know, the, there is a certain uh, uh, thing here where if I have a particle here, then the, this particle prefers to sort of hop in a certain direction. So it sort of is like a product of the density at the site and the current on a neighboring bond. Uh, so we've done both classical and, you know, exact diagonalization uh, calculations on the spin model. Uh, and again, we find results very similar. So this is now uh, at fixed interaction strength, but I'm varying the flux in the Haldane model and again, T2 on the y-axis. Uh, and again, nail order is stabilized for small values of second neighbor hopping, uh, but there is this very wide regime uh, where we find signatures of this tetrahedral state uh, over a you know, fair number of uh, lattice sites uh, diagonalization. Uh, so, so now we started asking, well, you know, if you always find this ordered state, it's not interesting. Can we actually implement this idea that you can sort of cause uh, fluctuations in this tetrahedral order and actually cause it to melt? Uh, 
Uh, and one heuristic way to think about this is if you look at any of these, uh, you know, hexagons in the tetrahedral ordered state, spins on opposite sides of the hexagon uh, are always pointing parallel. Uh, so one, you know, one way to think about trying to melt this is to try and add a third neighbor, you know, repulsion or a third neighbor antiferromagnetic exchange that causes these spins to sort of point away from each other. Uh, and in fact, what happens then is uh, this phase diagram here, where as we crank up T3, uh, we find that you, know, you can actually take this tetrahedral and drive it into a new phase, uh, which we uh, identify as a chiral spin liquid. Uh, and this identification sort of rests on uh, doing both exact diagonalization for the spectrum, uh, where here on the system size with 32 spins, uh, one finds this characteristic, you know, low-lying manifold of two states on the torus, uh, together with you know a bunch of uh, excitations over some spin gap. Uh, we've also calculated the many-body churn number, which uh, uh, Florian kind of mentioned uh, briefly, where you imagine threading flux through the two holes of the torus and following uh, the sort of tracking the Berry curvature of this many-body uh, level, and you can figure out what the total churn number is for the two states, and the total churn number turns out to be one. So these are all signatures of, uh, in exact diagonalization of the chiral spin liquid, uh, but uh, we also have results from uh, sort of infinite cylinder DMRG, where in, in an infinite cylinder, these two states that one finds uh, on the cylinder basically are states with well-defined flux through the cylinder, or a well-defined sort of quasi-particle uh, number through the cylinder, and in that infinite cylinder geometry, if one looks now at an entanglement cut that sort of breaks the cylinder into two parts, uh, one recovers the spectrum uh, in the two states, uh, the spectrum of basically uh, which the entanglement spectrum sort of reflects the spectrum of what might happen at a physical edge. Uh, so there are these chiral uh, modes that are seen in the spectrum where it sort of tilts towards one direction as opposed to being sort of symmetric going along both directions. Uh, and one can sort of count the you know, approximate degeneracies here, uh, which just agrees with sort of what you have for a chiral free boson in this problem. So, so, the, uh, so what we then started thinking about is asking, well, you know, is, is there a way to actually make this idea a little more concrete, this idea that you, know, you can start with magnetically ordered states and sort of melt them to get this uh, chiral spin liquid? Or in the language of bosons, it would be taking the supersolid phase of bosons and actually melting it to get this Laughlin uh, liquid. Okay, so one can think of somehow uh, spin-ordered states as being sort of parents for uh, certain spin-disordered uh, liquids. Okay, so there are various ways one sort of approaches these kinds of uh, spin-liquid phases. You know, starting by thinking in terms of you know short-range singlets which might then, you know, instead of crystallizing, kind of become a random superposition of many different patterns, which is sort of this old uh, RVB uh, idea of uh, Phil Anderson. Uh, there are these Goodfiller projection, which kind of are analogous to projection that uh, Jason talked about, where you imagine taking a given state of fermions and just projecting out all the configurations that you don't like. Uh, and that's sort of another uh, way one sort of approaches spin liquids. Uh, but there is this third nice route where you think about disordering certain uh, parent magnetically ordered states. And so the question we were interested in asking whether, in fact, this thing holds beyond the numerics, can one actually formalize this a little more clearly? Uh, so, so we have uh, you know, formulated a theory where one thinks about uh, a Chern-Simons theory where, of course, if you want to recover the topological order in the gap spin liquid, there is some effective churn simons gauge field, uh, and this churn simons theory describes for us, for instance, if you have a torus, then it will basically recover the, the two-fold degeneracy on the torus uh, in the spin liquid side where you imagine integrating out you know, all the, uh, the particle excitations, uh, then one recovers the, the correct topological order. Uh, but what we want to do from here is to sort of be able to recover both excitations, the anionic excitations in the spin liquid, uh, as well as examine sort of transition to this nearby magnetic order. Okay. So you can think of this as trying to attempt sort of a theory of the crystallization from this liquid. We want to ask, well, what are the nearby crystal states uh, of these bosons or of the spin crystallization? Uh, so what we want to then do is ask about, you know, so the way you can think about ordered states of a magnet is to imagine condensing some kind of Bose condensation process. Uh, 
Uh, and so one can sort of couple this churn simons gauge field uh, to bosonic uh, spin-on excitations, which are basically spin one-half excitations that minimally couple to this gauge field. Okay? Uh, and that has two effects. In the spin liquid, these, uh, this coupling basically binds pi flux to each of these uh, spin-ons and sort of convert them into uh, semi-ons, which is kind of the right uh, statistics for these particles. Uh, but at the same time, one can imagine driving the system such that these spin-ons will eventually condense at some point uh, and uh, give rise to magnetically ordered states. Okay? Uh, so we formulated, uh, maybe I'll sort of skip over the details, but we formulated, uh, uh, you know, what's the right structure for these spin-ons in order to be able to recover this kind of tetrahedral state. Uh, and one can sort of formulate it by thinking about, you know, what are the berry fluxes that the spin-on would pick up were it to traverse sort of closed loops in the presence of this kind of a background. Okay. Uh, so crudely speaking, you know, imagine my tetrahedral state is disordered, but locally I still preserve this tetrahedral order, then e even though my magnetic fields average to zero, my Zeeman fields acting on these particles will average to zero, nevertheless when I perform sort of local closed loops, uh, I will be able to see these fluxes. Um, so what that gives rise to is uh, basically a Hofstadter problem for these uh, spin-ons, where if we traverse a triangular plaquette, uh, it turns out that they pick up flux pi by 2, uh, whereas if they tra traverse this kind of hexagonal plaquette, uh, then they go twice around the face of one of these tetrahedra, so they pick up pi flux. Uh, so there's a certain uh, structure to the dispersion of these bosons, uh, and based on that, one can write down basically this four-flavor uh, theory of uh, spin-ons coupled to the, the gauge field. Okay? Uh, and what that does, we'll sort of skip over this, uh, but what that does at mean field level is to allow us to sort of go between a state where one has the chiral spin liquid where these spin-ons are gapped, uh, and if you tune the mass of these particles, eventually they condense at some point and give rise to tetrahedral order. Okay? So this is just you know, at mean field level, just basically just minimizing a certain complicated looking um, action there. Okay. And that gives rise to, at mean field level, this continuous uh, transition. So what we've uh, done so far is basically to realize that this Haldane model can, you know, the, the simplest version of this Haldane model gives rise to magnetically ordered states, uh, but that there is at least a nearby uh, fractional quantum Hall liquid uh, that one should hopefully be able to explore uh, in experiments. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears now and uh, talk a bit about the second part. And how much time do I have to do? About and 10 minutes. You have 12 okay. Sure. Sure. okay. So, so the reason we were interested uh, in this problem was uh, twofold. So of course, you know, when one thinks about the conventional Bose-Hubbard model, this has been explored extensively in uh, in uh, experiments. Uh, in fact, seminal experiments by Marcus uh, here. And uh, it shows this characteristic pattern of Mott insulator lobes separated from the superfluid by phase transitions. Uh, so the question we were asking was what happens in the presence of uh, magnetic flux? Uh, and this question sort of was motivated, of course, by uh, the experiments uh, that Monica presented and that many others uh, had been looking at. Uh, but also, it, there is sort of very old uh, motivation for this, going back to thinking about Josephson junction arrays uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. Okay. So, so what people can manufacture and you know, did uh, uh, at the time is you sort of make up an array of these you know, tiny Josephson, uh, you know, tiny superconducting islands, uh, which are weakly coupled to one another through a small Josephson coupling. Uh, and now the, the Cooper pairs can hop from one island to the other. Uh, and, and when they do that, there is a certain, uh, so this is like the analog of the bosons hopping around on the lattice. Uh, but there's a certain capacitance for each island, which means that if I try and add charge to this island, uh, it's not sort of very, uh, it, it doesn't like it very much. Uh, and so there's a certain repulsion energy, which, you know, locally looks like, you know, the charge square divided by the capacitance of this island. Okay. So by tuning the size of these islands, one can tune the ratio of this charging energy to the Josephson uh, coupling, or equivalently the Hubbard repulsion to the hopping uh, of these Cooper pairs. Uh, so what one finds is depending on the sample, so here, you know, every time you want to change the capacitance in this picture, you're imagining fabricating a different array with different island sizes. Uh, and so there is some set of samples. Uh, 
where if you measure transport, then for instance, as you cool the system, this one becomes a superconductor eventually, the resistance kind of goes to zero, you know, whatever they can measure. Uh, but if the islands are small enough, then uh, in fact the resistance shoots up and so you get this insulating uh, state. Uh, so you can sort of plot this uh, thing at zero magnetic applied magnetic field, uh, and there is this, uh, you know, so every point here now is a different array, uh, and you find that there are these superconducting regions and insulating uh, regions. But one can ask what happens if you now turn on flux, okay? So now when the Cooper pairs kind of hop around from island to island around some plaquette, uh, they will now see a certain flux, and F equal to one half is what, they call sort of full frustration, which is the case where there's pi flux or half of a superconducting flux quantum through each of this uh, plaquettes. Okay. Uh, and in this case, one finds that qualitatively it looks similar. Of course, they can't explore this in great detail. Uh, so they have a few sort of points here, but qualitatively there's an insulator and a superconductor, but now one finds that the, the critical value of the charging energy uh, moves to smaller values. In other words, it's easier to make the system an insulator. Uh, but there are certain problems. For instance, there's a fair amount of disorder that's inherent to these systems. Uh, and as you see from here, every time you want to probe a different parameter point here, you're sort of making one more uh, array unless there's sort of more clever ways to tune the system. Okay. So, so the, uh, there was an old proposal to kind of you know, simulate uh, this problem using uh, the, the cold atoms. And so we are sort of motivated by you know, this work and you know, what Marcus just uh, uh, told me about just before uh, his talk, uh, that, that one can sort of do these things with cold atoms now. And so the question we were interested in uh, at the time was asking, you know, how does flux actually modify the physics of the superfluid insulator transition? Okay. Uh, so very quickly, what, what the, uh, the model looks like this, we have pi flux through each plaquette and you can pick some gauge where all the hoppings, let's say, are negative here, all the hoppings are positive there, so that in this gauge it's translationally invariant and encloses pi flux. Uh, and now one sort of puts in uh, this repulsion uh, between particles. Okay. So we've studied this uh, problem numerically, and I'll turn to that in a second. But but crucially, uh, so crudely speaking, what happens is this thing here gives rise to you know two bands in the dispersion, uh, the, and the lower band here has uh, two degenerate minima. And so this is a problem where if you try and condense bosons, there are many ways to do it for non-interacting particles. Uh, but once interactions are included, even at just mean field level, they favor this kind of particular pattern where bosons at this minima and this minima, they sort of condense into this coherent superposition with a relative phase of plus or minus pi by two. Uh, so what that does is give rise to sort of a pattern of circulating currents where, you know, this is one pattern I've shown. There's an equivalent one where all the currents are reversed, uh, which is the time reverse sort of counterpart of the state. Okay. So one or the other state will be spontaneously uh, chosen. So, so there's one way to sort of detect these currents, which is to think about quench dynamics. Imagine you take, you know, here I've just shown it for a 2D array now of such pi flux, uh, where you have these kinds of currents flowing around. Imagine we suddenly sort of turn off hopping on one of these, uh, you know, one of these directions. Uh, then we'll have, you know, current conservation is, you know, temporarily broken. And what's going to happen is you're going to get density dynamics such that, you know, particle number will be high on one sub lattice a little while later, uh, but then it's going to slosh back and forth. Okay. So, uh, so here, this is at some, you know, maybe like few particles. This was some Gross-Kitevsky simulation, so it's like about 100. <laughs> so the initial state is, so here I'm just showing in a harmonic trap, uh, we have just these loop currents flowing around on the harmonic trap, <coughs> these staggered loop current states. So this would be the ground state of this Hamiltonian. Uh, in the harmonic trap, so the density goes to zero at the edges. But once we do the quench, then one gets this density dynamics where the particle density on one sublattice becomes high, followed by you know particle number being high on the other sublattice. So there is this kind of beating pattern uh, that survives out to fairly uh, you know, some reasonable uh, times in uh, measured in units of the tunneling. Uh, and eventually, of course, because the density is not uniform and so on, all this you know these sort of nice oscillations will eventually uh, decay in the end. Uh, so what we've done is study the problem with, uh, with strong interactions now uh, using both uh, 
you know, mapping to an effective classical uh, XY model as well as, you know, more direct uh, DMRG simulations at low filling with, you know, one particle per site. Uh, and in both cases, one finds that between the superfluid and the ordinary Mott insulator, there's this window where the insulator coexists with uh, staggered loop currents. Uh, and so there is kind of two pictures, uh, actually both of which build upon work that uh, Halpin had done a while ago, one of which uh, Mark has actually mentioned, which is that if you think about the superfluid phase, you can think about it as a phase where, you know, you have some pattern of vortices which are basically locked into some crystalline array uh, so that there is this regular pattern of currents. Uh, but, but if you think about the usual Mott insulator, it's one where the phase is disordered. And so these vortices are basically, you know, uh, just quantum mechanically moving around. Uh, and so one can think of the usual Mott insulator as just a superfluid of these vortices. Okay? Or in 1D, it's like one case where you have a lot of phase slips uh, across the system, uh, which are proliferated. Um, the chiral Mott insulator in this language, you can think of it as a super solid of vortices where you somehow preserve the crystallinity uh, while allowing for a lot of phase slips. Okay? So you kind of have condensation of these vortices and uh, but, but at the same time, they preserve the crystalline order in the background. So it's some kind of a super solid of vortices where, uh, you know, you lose the superfluidity, but you preserve the order of currents in the system. Uh, there is another uh, picture for this, uh, which is in terms of excitons. So for instance, if you take, take a semiconductor, right, you one can sort of make excitons where you start with a gapped ground state and you make a particle hole excitation where, you know, you make this with you know, one particle in the conduction band, one in the valence band. Uh, but, but here uh, in the bosonic Mott insulator, you can think of gap, you know, you can have double occupancies and vacancies. Uh, and it's a little bit like a semiconductor in that sense. Okay? Uh, but because you have two of these minima in the dispersion, these uh, particles have basically, it's like a two valley semiconductor and one can now have uh, indirect excitons where they are formed from particles and holes living in different valleys uh, in the system. And so in fact, if you have excitons, uh, you, know, you can have excitons whose wave function uh, is such that if it condenses, it actually breaks time reversal. So, so this is not Bose condensation. There is no superfluidity, but you condense this bilinear or this uh, exciton, uh, and so that will give rise to you know, current patterns because of broken time reversal, but there'll be no superfluidity. Uh, so, so let me, uh, with that, summarize and can take questions. But uh, there are these two, uh, you know, interesting aspects uh, that we focused on uh, with interacting particles and uh, gauge fields. Thank you for your attention. Well, it's similar to what you would expect, you know, like in, for example, if you take a 2D system, right, you would expect that there'll be logarithmic interactions between vortices because of the fact that, you know, th there is certain, you know, phase gradients that you're setting up or certain currents that you're setting up in the system. So an isolated vortex costs an energy that's logarithmically large in the system size. So these are neutral superfluids, so it'll just grow with the system size. Okay, but and, mm -hmm. No, you need some, so in order to stabilize these vortices, you do need some interactions in the superfluid. Right, so like, right, so these vortices appear, I mean, the vortices, so for example, if you take a Bose condensate and you imagine making a vortex in the Bose condensate, there'll be a certain healing length. So the size of this vortex will depend on the strength of the interaction. Okay, so in some picture, yeah. I can think of this kind of ordering of the vortices as minimizing the cost associated with the contact interaction. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we've not looked at the case where the uniform flux is tuned, uh, so I actually don't know the answer to that, but there is some work from, um, uh, I think, Uli Scholwalk and people have looked at that, and there are some more interesting phases that emerge uh, in the system, uh, but I don't have a picture. Yeah. 
No, so in, in general, if you have a certain flux per plicket, you will get multiple minima in the dispersion, right? So, so if you have some particular pattern of fluxes, you will get more than two minima, right? And so in principle, one could get more complicated states than what I've talked about here. Yeah. Yeah. Super simple picture, and I'm, my question is this is right at any point. So, if, if I want to minimize the kinetic energy, I would say, well, let's take the one year orbital transit of the two million strands and then just put the bosons in there and let them form a mod insulator in, of these one year orbitals that are occupied by an infinite number of bosons. Because then, you know, from the one year orbitals, I get the current, and from the fact that I have an infinite number, I get these mod time states. So, my question is, is that at any like, is this? So can, can you this thing? So so you're going to take this lattice model, and <laughs> yeah. Right, and then you, you get many strands, and you can yeah. construct many orbitals for those strands, and they extend yeah. over a few lattice sites. Yeah. And then you can just put more bosons in there, and you know just write down mod state and get some mod insulation. Right. So you could imagine putting one particle per two sites. Right, and then I suspect there might be other phases present in the problem. Uh, so here we're thinking of one particle per site, which would be sort of two particles per magnetic unit cell. Right, but then you can think of putting two mod instead of these one year orbitals. Right, so, so you could get, okay, so, yeah, but, but there is this intermediate phase that, so one way to think about this is, you know, you're kind of breaking two different symmetries when you go from the superfluid with broken time reversal into the ordinary mod phase, right? Uh, and in principle, that means that, you know, or, or you know, imagine this was happening in a 2D system, then you have true broken U1 symmetry and broken time reversal. And in principle, it allows for an intermediate phase in the problem. Yeah. Is that I, I, I try to understand the, the, the yeah. physics and the, the wave functions of the mod or the tile mod uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I can I understand as follows uh, uh, that uh, the the energetics favors the localized all the particles. They have one or the it favors almost uh, mostly one particle per site. However, the quantum fluctuations every now and then you get big particles from one side to the other ones. Uh, and and but then since you have a flux, mm -hmm. and then therefore the, this. The, 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 this excitation would, would, would therefore see the flux, mm -hmm. and so so from that point of view, then I I, I would imagine you would have a tile garage of this excitation for all fluxes. That's not really pi, right? So so from yeah, like, sure. So at pi, the only difference is here at pi, time reversal is broken spontaneously. So so it allows for you know so so there are two different broken symmetries. Um, two spontaneously broken symmetries. Yeah, so so, so if you break time reversal by hand, then one of the broken symmetries is broken by hand. So that's that's the difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we should thank all the speakers.